I, I just feel that, you know, so, so many times we allow others to tell us the context of the work, yes. especially in, in institutions. Right. You yes. know, right. Like, like it's a black play and it's, that's all it and is that's and that's how it lives. It. It's first and foremost black. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. You have to put right. your feminist and your queerness away yeah. because it's a black play. Right. You know, and as a writer, I've always been told, like, is it a black play? Is it a gay play? Is it a family play? I'm like, it's all that. Yeah. Why can't it hold all of that? This episode of The Public Square 2.0 includes conversations around topics of race and discrimination. Just a heads up, in case you have young ears around. Hey everybody, it's Garlia here at The Public. The Public Theater is... Your work. <laughs> okay. Hello and welcome to The Public Square. My name is Garlia Cornelia Jones. And recently, I was given the honor of becoming the Director of Innovation and New Media at the Public Theater. As part of this new position, it's my responsibility to push the boundaries, to use more contemporary forms of art, to reintroduce you to us. So here we are with our second full episode in the newly relaunched podcast, Public Square 2.0. On our first episode, we had a chance to sit down and talk with Pulitzer Prize winning playwright Susan Laurie Parks. And if you haven't had a chance, go back and take a listen. In fact, you should like, follow, and subscribe. That way you'll always know when we drop something new. Also, you might have noticed by now that I'm a person who stutters, which is something that you will periodically experience as we grow together. Joy Gresham was an essential part of this production. And really, Joy is an essential part of every production of A Raisin in the Sun, even the one that I directed in college all those years ago. In her role as director and trustee of the Lorraine Hansberry Literary Trust, it's Joy's responsibility to approve every production of A Raisin in the Sun, every single one across the world. Remounting such an established work can come with some challenges. We talked about those along with the thrills. Here is part of that conversation. Public Square 2.0, Season 1, Episode 2. Um, I'm uh, Robert O'Hara, and I'm a writer and a director. Um, I'm Joy Gresham, and I am um, the literary trustee to Lorraine Hansberry's estate. Okay, we are here. Once again, we're doing a podcast episode, which is very exciting and uh, new, new for, for us and for, for me and for the public. And I am very excited to have both of you he here for the, for this. We're very honored that you, you know, would want to be part of this, this conversation for Raisin in the Sun. Um, jo Joy, I, I just want to start for people who, who may not know who you are and, and your Kind of, kind of connection to the to Lorraine and 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 the show. If you can just share a, a bit about your connect, connection and why it's really valuable that we have you here in in in, in this space with with us. Great. Um, I have a family connection to Lorraine. Um, my father, Robert Nimeroff, was Lorraine's uh, creative collaborator. And upon her death, she named him as her literary executor. My mother and I married Robert Nimeroff when I was about nine years old. Um, he became my father. Mm. And this was two years after Lorraine died. Mm. And I grew up in her world. I grew mm. up in her home. And I grew up um, bearing witness to the building of her legacy. And so presently, I own and I manage all of her copyrights. Mm. Um, a large part of what I do is I license her work, mm -hmm. but I also um, 
have kind of inherited the role of script supervisor. Mm-hmm. So I, I really represent the author <laughs> and her words. Yeah. And I follow um, productions very closely. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm very select because Hansberry's plays and most significantly A Raisin in the Sun is being produced somewhere in the world every right. single day. Right. And so um, aside from approval, final approval in Mm -hmm. the licensing. I also um, have the, um, really the the privilege and the joy of selecting um, which productions I follow. Mm -hmm. Some Mm -hmm. of them I'm involved in as a script consultant Mm -hmm. and sort of as a creative consultant. And some of them I I just follow in terms of um, my interest in the legacy and where it's going yeah. and who it's influencing yeah. and affecting. And what was that like as a child? I know um, we we had a post-show conversation the, uh, the other night, and so you started to talk a little, little bit about sort of being in Lorraine's home and, and just being a, ra- around her with with without her, and so sort of getting to know her through her sp- Space, right, and so thinking about what it means to be in a person's space, and to know that space, and to know a little bit about them, but not get get to know them, and being a small child, a child too. I have right. kids who are right. eight and and, yeah. and ten, so thinking about like they're in a space and they're thinking about a person. Well, well what was that like? Uh, what I was love, that like? love that question. So I was an only child. Okay, and I, um, I. My mother says that I was dancing before I walked, okay. so I was raised as a dancer. Okay. And I, when I was 12 years old, I decided I wanted to become a choreographer. Okay. But when I was a young child, I made dances all the time. Okay. And Lorraine's house was this beautiful house that was filled with empty spaces. Mm. It's this house that she bought on from the proceeds of the film, A Raisin in the Sun. Okay. It's this huge modern house and it just had empty rooms. Mm. Some of the rooms had a little furniture, (laughs) but to me they were studios. And I remember growing up with Lorraine as my muse and she was always there. Mm. And I refer to us as Lorraine's chosen family. Mm. And so I kind of grew up where she was my spiritual mother sister mm-hmm. and she was a presence that was really you know you could touch it it was mm-hmm. real and um i grew up in a house that was just filled with her this this home was her sanctuary she mm-hmm. would leave the city and she would mm-hmm. go up to this house and mm-hmm. you know from having a home like this it was her place to mm-hmm. just take care of herself, care of herself. Yeah. <laughs> and so um it was filled with her books, yeah. her LPs, her, uh. her art, beautiful mm. art, um, and um, her tchotchkes, her stuff. Her stuff, yeah. She was really, really funny. She had dolls and mechanicals and all kinds of things yeah. that she loved to have around her. Yeah. And it was, it was a great child's world. Yeah. And so I grew up really thinking of her. And Lorraine was kind of this Peter Pan kind of character. Mm. She was eternally young, and mm-hmm. there was all this youthfulness that she surrounded herself mm-hmm. with. And so she was really kind of more sister to me mm. than mother. Yeah. But she was um, a real uh, inspiration. So I grew up loving her and yeah. being incredibly inspired by her right. and, um, like, listening for her. So any yeah. talk of her just went right into my brain right. centers. Yeah. Um any, any, especially any talk about who she was. Mm-hmm. And I remember more, more than anything, um, my father had um, this Wallen sack. Do you know what a Wallen sack mm-hmm. is? It's a reel to reel machine, you okay. know, a tape recorder. Okay. Oh, yes. Okay. Um, that was sort of the standard bearer at the time, the Wallen sack. It was this machine. And he had all of these reels of Lorraine talking, oh, wow. singing, um, 
Lorraine loved to have dinner parties mm. where she would just like talk anybody under the table. <laughs> <laughs> and he would play them all the time. He was transcribing them, using them for one thing or another. Yeah. And I just remember her voice. She had the most mm. melodious, honey, deep voice. And she would talk through the walls. And I just remember her presence was just an incredible mm. um, inspiration to me as kind of a growing, you know, person. Yeah. In the arts and th in the th arts, yeah. as well as um, she just really influenced me. Yeah. Um, her feminisms just really influenced me to be the person with the confidence and the strength and yeah. the integrity that I try to live by. Yeah. It's so odd to me <laughs> because I'm just like, what was your mother must be thinking about that there's this other woman? Oh. There's this ex wife. That that's a story. I mean, that answer is could go on and on and on. <laughs> yeah. My mother yeah. was extraordinary. She um she first of all, I, it it really begins with Bob's relationship with Lorraine, which was really um they were she called him her her best friend. They were really um uh, continuous with one another in terms of their thinking and their mm -hmm. beliefs. And they had a, a deep trust and respect for one another. So the relationship that existed, that we stepped into, was not a relationship of another woman. Mm -hmm. It was sort of a relationship of, of joining the family of Lorraine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> And my mother was a was a writer mm -hmm. um, and was a professor of, of of black literature, and so she had a deep respect for Lorraine, mm. and um, sort of a hunger, you know, as a as a intellectual and a scholar to complete Lorraine's project too. Mm -hmm. And so um, there was just a, a feeling of commitment that I remember that my mother had. Um, that inspired me too, as much as I could understand it. Mm -hmm. So there was never ever any kind of confusion, except that everybody loved Lorraine. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I just remember that that was something that I absolutely knew and trusted and experienced. Mm -hmm. um, and there was never any tensions about that. Um, and if my mother showed that, I would have seen it immediately, but there, there was never mm -hmm. any kind of indication that there was any problem with that. Um, but the idea of, of giving yourself totally to someone mm -hmm. um, and serving their legacy mm -hmm. was a really big idea for me to grow into, and I'm still growing into right. it. I'm still trying to figure yeah. out you and, know, what and, that means. And there's... there's uh, Something that is, as you're speaking, I'm thinking about like our ancestors and the the past and and how that imp impacts our our everyday lives. And I'm also thinking about some of the and this is jumping ahead a little bit, so maybe so we we will go back. But thinking a little bit about some of the work that you you did in this production of bringing the Past and the ancestors of the of the family into the right. the right. world and thinking about how impo important it is right. and and how you feel them even if they're not in this in the the space mm. and that's something I got I've now seen raisin two times right your production and the father felt so much more present mm. to 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 me in in this production mm -hmm. so i'm i'm just you know as 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 you're speaking about Lorraine and being in her home i i i i really i have this visual right mm. of of her being in that space the same way i um i have f from the product production that you know, will will soon soon end. Yeah. Well, I mean, you you grew up in a ghost story, right? <laughs> um, 
And in many ways, <laughs> yeah. uh, the, the production of I Am Doing is a ghost story. It's a, yeah. Yes, you talk about mm. that. Yeah, yeah, I think that's true. Mm. I think the, the, um, the, that place, entering in that play, into that space where past, present, and future mm -hmm. um, yeah. co-inhabit, you yeah. know, and, and um, we at the same time have access to what's been to now and to what we imagine lies before us. Yeah. And um, that's... That's something that was familiar to me. My mother, my mother's family, my mother's side. It's the, it's that feeling of um, legacy and past, yeah. yeah, and and embodying that, right. And so you two met and and have worked to get together be before because of your produ produ production of a Raise in the Sun at w Williamstown. Is that the the, the first? Yeah. 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 Yeah, um, I think you came to like the f one of the first rehearsals, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. To talk to the cast and yeah. mm -hmm. uh, Grace gave her time mm -hmm. to answer questions and give us the context and yeah. legacy of mm -hmm. Hansberry mm -hmm. uh, because you, you don't normally estates don't show up, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, no they, people. Yeah, uh, so uh, it was uh, an honor, actually, yeah, as for the Williamstown production, yeah, yeah. And 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 thinking about the the how how do the the actors in the play res, respond to being being able to be part of this this conversation and to connect connect with you with with mm. with you? How do you think they responded? Well, I have a I have a tradition of um, those those plays, those productions that I select to have an involvement with. Mm -hmm. I have a tradition of visiting and welcoming the cast to the, the company, mm. to the legacy. Okay. It's kind of a ritual of mm. mine. It's kind of a sacred space of stepping in yeah. and, and talking about um, just holding the, sharing the responsibility of what this means to yeah. step into this, yeah. these words. And um, it's something that means a lot to me. I do it for myself. Yeah. But I also do it for Lorraine. Yeah. And um, it's, um, it's an opportunity for, um, I've said it, the, I think the last time I visited the cast, um, it's a time for Lorraine to be represented, not the mm. estate, not in a state. Yeah, right. It's, it's time for um, Lorraine spirit to come in. So it's really special. Mm -hmm. And I'm always, I get, a, I receive a lot of love mm -hmm. from doing it. I mean, yeah. people appreciate it. Mm -hmm. And people can, I think because of that, they can lay claim to Lorraine in a way that they might not have access to mm. otherwise. I mean, they can, they, can, they can offer a story yeah. or they can tell me how they came to know this play or what it means to them. Um, so it becomes intimate on a level that is not usually there right. for people to work as part of the creative process, yeah. you know, to, for them to work in, so. Yeah. It's also different than, you know, other classics um, right. because I think for instance you know many of the people who come in to talk about classical work are talking about it uh, from a perspective of what they've seen and what they've learned from the work and right. how they think it should be presented in, in a sort of academic conversation right. right and not a conversation i mean no one's walking in and saying well i think this is the emotional value of shakespeare right you know right yeah. or arthur miller really felt like da, 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 da. Mm -hmm. you know it's like right. uh, or with right. any sort of like you know uh capacity for uh yeah having a sort of emotional connection mm -hmm. to the work it's right. a really sort of you know coldness uh because you know we're not used to people coming in and going welcome to the legacy of mm -hmm. arthur miller right <laughs> right. Right. Absolutely. Right. You know? absolutely. Right. No, you're so right. And I think 
there's a there's almost a branding that's going on mm -hmm. so that you're you you know you taught you you're, you're uh, the, the conversations about you know how to fit into the brand mm. and this isn't that at all right. I mean I um, to go back to my connection story yeah to Lorraine I think that um, my whole journey as a literary trustee mm -hmm. is to deepen my relationship with Lorraine. Mm -hmm. And I benefited from my father's deep relationship with her mm -hmm. um, to, the, to the point where in, 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 his, in his, um, his editing of the scripts and his um, uh, production histories that he writes mm -hmm. for each of the mm -hmm. for each of the uh, plays. Yeah. Um, he's continuous with her. I yeah. mean, it, it's really yeah. hard to kind of tease them out. Mm. And he uh, always offered a transparency to what he was doing, mm -hmm. so that Lorraine was always. It was always Lorraine. It was always her words. Mm -hmm. It was always her thinking. And he just drew from whatever notes he had from working with her. And um, um, transcribing of conversations that he had with mm -hmm. Lorraine um, to just fill out her words and her thoughts. Right. So it's all Lorraine. Yeah. and. When my, uh, one of the things that my mother did as um, the successor executor after my father died in 1991, okay. uh, under her watch, all of Lorraine's papers were deposited at the Schomburg Center. Okay. And um, that was a major project just mm -hmm. to get everything that was, the house was just filled to the brim. With. with her stuff, yeah. right. <laughs> her writings, her right. artwork, her journals, her diaries, her correspondence. Yeah. Yeah. I like to say there were there was like four, 14 file cabinets oh, wow. just packed okay. with stuff, suitcases mm -hmm. packed with mm -hmm. stuff. And um, she, uh, all of that material was transferred to the Schomburg. And um, my mother, when my mother passed away in 2005, um, my way into Lorraine and, mm -hmm. and sort of getting to know her more mm -hmm. was to kind of situate myself in the Schomburg and in those mm -hmm. papers. Okay. And just, I was always Deep maybe back. like one baby step ahead. Of, <laughs> Of any of the scholars and the researchers, because people would ask me about a very specific um, body of writing, and yeah. I would have to like stay up and cram, yeah, mm -hmm. so that I would have some have sense of what they were talking about. So yeah. it was very intense, very compact, and and you know, a, a, a kind of a, a madness in trying to get a deeper understanding. Um, but, but. My, all of that to say, um, it's a, it's a committed desire to know her. Mm -hmm. So it's a very different position for me to hold that as a literary trustee yeah. and to approach it that way. Yeah, and so I'm just I'm just wanting to share what I know yeah. and what I understand yeah. with. Uh, you know, with artists. Yeah. When we had the, the conversation, the post show, we had a brief conversation about um, sort of the productions that you say okay, okay to and the production that you say no, no, no to, and thinking about what really s stuck out to you and, and what continues to make you say, this is a way that we've pu pushed this show a little bit. For further is something that, that you have sp 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 right. spoken about. And I know, Robert, you have spoken about as well. And we had sort of our, you know, in internal, you know, conversations about the way mm. that, that you you were interested in and, in, um, you know, talking about the the 
the the show. So for people who don't have inside public theater kind of um, things, would love to hear. Yeah. Um, one of the rules that I have to follow as a, a literary trustee and as a licensor mm -hmm. is um, that there can be no changes to Hansberry's words mm -hmm. in the plays. So there can't, any requests to um, edit or move around or delete mm -hmm. is declined. Mm -hmm. So that, that has led me to serve her plays, her writing, at, her texts as um, sort of a, a deep, rich well mm -hmm. to draw from. Mm -hmm. And my philosophy in working with directors is, um, you know, draw deep and wide, you know? Yeah. And so, um, I, I respect directors, I respect the task of, of directing and working with such a formidable text mm -hmm. I, and formidable rule. I also um, respect the vision of directors. Mm -hmm. And um, A Raisin in the Sun is such a huge classic that many people, um, come with complete um, respect and admiration and kind of devotion to mm -hmm. Hansberry's text mm -hmm. and serving it yeah. as they should. Yeah. Um, but sometimes that can um, be overhandled, mm -hmm. you know, and, 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 and you see the same productions over and over. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I immediately recognized when I saw Robert's, um, production, uh, last production at Williamstown, that, um, something really special was happening mm -hmm. because Robert's a risk taker <laughs> and, um, he, he brings a, his very strong, interpretation and reading and vision to the production. And so he was doing some courageous things that I don't usually see directors mm -hmm. do. Mm -hmm. So I um, was really, really drawn to it and excited by it. At the same time, the, little, the literary trustee in me was like, <gasps> <laughs> It, you know, yeah, like, oh. because he goes Oops. there and he's like, yeah. oh, oh, no. no <laughs> <laughs> so it really um, allowed me to 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 negotiate uh, what can he do and what can't he do? Yeah. Mm. And um, so from the beginning, I was <laughs> responding to Robert after I saw it with my personal feelings, which I'm real clear and separating. Yeah. So like for me, um, I love this, mm -hmm. you know, I'm really excited about this. I'm really nervous, you know, good nervous about mm -hmm. this part. Mm -hmm. You're pushing it here. Yeah. This is good. Yeah. Because I believe and I know from experience that um, attention will always go back to what Hansberry wrote mm -hmm. to the text. Yeah. And the text will withstand any kind of mm -hmm. interrogation, so mm -hmm. it's fine. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and at the same time, it really led, it really rated my own belief, you know, my own sanctuary mm -hmm. of, of understanding what this play is about. Yeah. You know, yeah. my own version of what this play is about. Right. right? And um, I knew instantaneously that that was important to the legacy mm. of this play, mm -hmm. that I wanted that kind of production out there for people to see, mm -hmm. and that it would speak to another audience, maybe the audience of, you know, my children, mm -hmm. um, you know, to a new audience that um, would immediately just kind of inhale it yeah. and recognize themselves in it. And so there's something extremely exciting to me about that, mm -hmm. even though 
it creates conflict in me. Yeah. Um, so it was a risk for me. Yeah. On some level, but I completely stand by it today. Right. You know, I think I think it's really important. Yeah. Well, and I'll just say quickly for, for Robert, if you're going to respond, thinking about the te te text and how it makes you want to go back. There are so many moments in this production, and I, I shared with with Joy that the first play I ever directed was A Raisin in the Sun in um, a college, and Joy at, at the post-show conversation was talking about how, you know, when our productions are up and if people don't, you know, don't inform the estate, then Joy's part of the people says, oh, hey, you have to do this. And she looked at me and I said, oh, did, did you know? Because, <laughs> because when we did our production, this is a very long time ago, but the, the school received some um, notice and I, I, it was the first time, okay? I wasn't, I'll never, I would never do that now, but it was the first time and I said, oh no, Joy, you, we came full circle. We paid our dues. It was fine. It was a wonderful production, I think, my first show, but I'm not director anymore that was old 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 days but just thinking about that and it made me really think about oh well what what was this scene like seeing you your production I just was like I'm gonna go back to, to my script yeah. and look <laughs> was that was that there yes it was oh right and right. so I'm just just really I I think that that it that is what happens when we push the the envelope as we can really say Oh, that was there the whole time, but now we're seeing it through a different lens. Um. Well, yeah, I think that that's absolutely right. You know, I mean, th the production made you go back to the script, yeah. Yeah. which is what uh, Troy was saying, is that it, you will always go back to Hansberry, yeah. right? Uh, and uh, I think that is the sort of, you know, what's exciting to me is to have people who think they know the play mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. go back to the play. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and also that the estate doesn't didn't operate out of fear, mm -hmm. right? Because there was a great deal of fear mm -hmm. involved, especially when you're talking about you know a transfer or a production right. uh, in New York City, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, but that doesn't mean you have to operate from fear, right? Uh, and I think that's right. uh, um, mm -hmm. what's fun about uh, Hensbury, because I keep saying I've said it over and over that you can't break it. <laughs> you know, it's the classic. There's nothing that I'm right. going to do right. that's going to remove Raising the Sun from being one of the greatest plays ever written. Right. Uh, and so, uh, you know, it does withstand interrogation, but in fact, it is there to be interrogated. Exactly. You know, exactly. And, and I think that uh, there are productions that are uh, that sort of put on, you know, uh, the museum gloves mm -hmm. and takes it out of the mm -hmm. box and places mm -hmm. it up on the stage and makes sure you don't ruin anything and puts it in its, very, its place. And so then you see, like, you know, you've seen hundreds and hundreds of the same production. Right, yeah. right. Uh, and then there are people who go in there and sort of, like, you know, change it, the furniture around and see what else you can see underneath that chair. Mm -hmm. or what else is back in that other room? What, yeah. what, what else is in there? You know, that's my job as a director. So you know, uh, is to interrogate the text. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, I'm just a handyman. Right. You know, I, I'm right. just someone coming in just to fix it up and make it look like it used to look. Right, you know? yeah. Uh, and I don't actually operate that way. So. Right. And I think that's so interesting because um, we really, we greatly miss and misunderstand Hansberry and this particular play, mm -hmm. if we think of it as untouchable, mm -hmm. if we think of it as something that needs to be um, left alone. Mm. Yeah. And in fact, Lorraine, um, as soon as the show was out, was, inc was tremendously disappointed and the lack of interrogation mm. by critics mm. and by audience, the, the fact that um, the play wasn't being taken seriously right. and, and looked at um, and entered into right. um, in order to really uh, understand it, yeah. you know, and, and, and engage it. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I, I, yeah, I think she wrote a play that allows us to enter into it. And in fact, um, we have a now old hashtag at Lorraine Hansberry Literary Trust, uh, 
which is chasing Lorraine. Mm. This idea that we, you know, we haven't yet, I, as an audience, grown to, we, ne- we haven't yet uh, entered a place where we're fully prepared to receive the place you wrote. Mm. You know, that we, we, we're, we're getting there. <laughs> yeah. And I think the thing that's so incredible about this production right now at this time is that um, Lorraine wrote this play in 1959, pre-movement. It mm-hmm. was before the civil rights movement. Mm-hmm. It was before the, the, uh, the, the great wave of feminism. Mm-hmm. Um, it was certainly before the um, LGBTQ uh, eruption. <laughs> right. And what happens is that um, it holds this pre-movement consciousness, mm. right. you know? Mm. And we're there now. Yes. We're, 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 we're right before something big mm-hmm. that's going to take us into like a new wave of rights. Right. You know, mm-hmm. the fight for rights. And so um, I, think, I think it's really important to to enter into this point now and to, you know, to engage it. Yeah. I, I was th- I was thinking about how do, do you respond? And you answer a little bit, but how, how do you respond to people who don't feel as if the place should be t- touched, right? How do you res- respond to people who f- feel like this should stay sort of in, 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 in this b- box and that's, that that's, that's it? And then also... What would make you say that someone can't can't do a, th- a thing, right? Like if if there had been something in this production or in others, what makes you say no, no, no? You you can't do to do that because that is going to pull away from from this lo- a le- legacy, right? I think um, that's an interesting question. The first part of the question is that what you do is you 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 re-enter the play through a production like Roberts, mm. which kind of stirs things up mm-hmm. and, uh, and allows the conversation to take place between, inter- between generations, because this isn't your grandma's A Raisin in the Sun. No, right. And I had the incredible experience at um, the dress rehearsal, which was the first time I saw the full, mm. the full, uh, full play. And the first time I saw it at the public, um, of sitting surrounded by like millennials, mm. <laughs> you yeah. know, um, that looked like my children, you know, and and I was just like I was surrounded by them, and they were just like so engaged, mm-hmm. and I and I just kind of left my body for a minute to be filled by their energy because yeah. they were completely in it. Yeah, and they were laughing. Like at times, I don't laugh, yeah. and they were, they yeah. were they were moved and they were energized in places where I get really still and quiet mm-hmm. and kind of scared. I mean, their response was completely different, and it was so I was just so filled with happiness. Mm. You yeah, know? yeah, because it was like yeah, yeah, yeah. It's passed on. Right. It's sort of right. like. This is exactly what yeah. should be happening. But I also know that there are people who are kind of like, oh. <laughs> yes. You know, yes. you yes. can feel the energy because yes. I'm sort of, I have moments of that where I'm like, mm-hmm. Yes. You know? <laughs> that's going yes. on too. Yes, yes. And that's all that should be yeah. happening. Yes, which was actually, I feel like, well, all of us on, on, on the podcast team have seen it. And so... A couple of us saw it, 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 it last night too, and I and and behind us afterwards, there were there were they were well there was an older audience. I don't know which generation there would be, but they're definitely not millennials who had a lot of comments about the end, right? Right. right. And whether that needed to be there, be there, right? And yeah. and then I think through. Throughout, we all res- responded to the songs and and just d- 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 different things. I have an eight year old b- boy who coincidentally got to hang out with Tucson. The two of them mm. became like very good oh. friends, so that was really cute. But 
Um, but when I, whenever, I, when I first wrote the play, I was in college. I didn't have any children. But so n- now seeing seeing Travis and seeing the way that Travis, that one scene where his mom says no and then he waits till his d- dad comes out, I didn't catch the first time I saw it. I caught it this time and I was like, mm. When, you, when your son uses, you know, w- like they use a, a different person to right. get what they want, and you know, but so all of these, all of these, these things, I th- I was really pull, 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 pulling, right, and right, I think right. you're you're responding to the way that, you know, millennials and Gen Z, because millennials is a really big gap, and I'm an older millennial, and so I don't relate to the younger ones either. Yeah. So that's a whole different, it's a different group. Right. We kind of feel some kind of way about being lumped in with all of them. Mm, yeah. um, but, 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 but I'm, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just res- responding to all of these. It, it was such, it's such, such a, a rich production, which sends us right back to that script. And it sends us right back to this, this honoring, this little legacy that you've really been do, doing and this this reinvention, which was a word that we've spoken of, a, a, which was has been a word that we have you you use is reinvention mm. and reinventing, um, and and what that does to a little a le- legacy, a le- yeah, yeah, a legacy, yeah, yeah, yeah. I um, so yeah, I want to I want to talk about that those terms for a minute because um. They've they've been troubling to me. Mm. Um, so let me go back for a minute to um, Robert's Coda in the play, mm-hmm. which is a great example mm-hmm. of a, a creative problem. Mm. So I was really excited about um, Robert's Coda when I first saw the play in Williamstown. Um, because Lorraine wrote multiple endings to A Raisin in the Sun. And uh, we know the uh, ending that was chosen Mm -hmm. for 1959 Broadway. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But she had another ending of the play which... um, where the family moves out to Clyburn Park and um, the mother, um, Lena, um, is seen patrolling the second floor uh, with a shotgun Mm. Mm. as the family's sleeping. Mm. And um, that was part of her own autobiography because when the Hansberries moved out to their the home that they had purchased, um, Carl Hansberry, Lorraine's father, was um, involved in a Supreme Court uh, case mm-hmm. um, and was working with the NAACP to um, to look at this whole situation of these covenants and, you know, the redlining. And um, he was gone much of the time with the NAACP preparing this case. Mm-hmm. And so when once they had moved into this neighborhood, uh, the family was in this crisis of having to protect themselves mm-hmm. with the father not being there. Mm-hmm. So uh, Nanny Hansberry, who was fierce, would just take care of her children mm-hmm. and would, you know, stay up and at night. Mm-hmm. And um, there's a famous situation where one night there was a um, a dangerous crowd outside and someone threw a brick in the, through the window and it just narrowly missed Lorraine's head mm-hmm. uh, when she was eight years old. And so um, the danger that this family, the youngers, is moving into was very, very real. Mm. So Lorraine had written a couple of different, two or three different endings that took us into Clyburn Park Mm. and kind of spelled out what they were finding. And through a process which um, was really long and involved, um, 
for 1959 Broadway, Lorraine and Lloyd Richards and uh, uh, the cast really working together, kind of workshopped and decided mm -hmm. on the ending that they chose, mm -hmm. which um, <clears throat> has them exiting the, the, the apartment, mm -hmm. you know, curtain. Right. So there's something wonderful about um, going further with it, mm. which is what Robert did. Yes. <laughs> and um, I think the point isn't what happens to them, because right. now, in 2022, we know what happens to them. <laughs> you know, it's, it's sort of, it, it, it's like, we know it's not rosy. We know it's hard. Right. right. Um, we know it's violent. Mm -hmm. Uh, we know who these people are on the other side. Yeah. But at the same time, there's something about kind of pronouncing that and articulating it mm -hmm. that's exciting. Yeah. So again, I'm sitting there, the millennials next to me are sort of <laughs> like, mm-hmm. And mm -hmm. then there are other people around them who are gasping. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, who are really yeah. like, <gasps> you know, and it's hard and it's shocking. Yeah. Um, yes. And I think all that's right. All yeah. of that's right. Yeah. So um, it just reminds me when I when I kind of went through that full meditation of like, how do I feel about this? You know, how do I feel about uh, how do I feel about this as a stakeholder in this story? Right. Like all of us are. Right. You know, right. not a special. You know. Yeah. Just a common stakeholder in yeah. this story, where I have I have I'm really attached to what happens to these folks. Right. You know. Versus how do I, how do I feel about this as Hansberry's representative, you know, mm. as a representative of her text and her work. And the text, yeah. And her choices. Let me provide a little context. The version of A Raisin in the Sun that most of us are used to, the one from the movie with Sidney Poitier and Ruby Dee, and that I directed back in school at Indiana University, has the younger family heading out at the end of the show, leaving their cramped apartment and moving into their new house in the white neighborhood of Clybourne Park. And while we know in the back of our minds that it won't be easy, we're usually left with a sense of hope as the matriarch, Lena Younger, collects her things, including a small plant that she has nurtured the entire show and heads out to meet their future. In this production, however, Robert decided to add a coda. Instead of Lena, it's Travis, the family's young son, who is left last on stage. As he gathers their belongings, the set pulls away and reveals the house into which they are moving. But instead of hope and warmth, the word nigger is scrawled across their home in red paint. This is the word to which Robert refers in this episode. And one example of how his production pushed beyond the expected. We'll pick up this thread of the conversation after a short break. Just Hope is still here and transforming people and passing along the message that really is New York, that we are here as a family and we must commune and we must tell our stories. We must hear the stories that make up this diversity. Some say art is impractical, frivolous, a fantasy. To them we say, yes, it's all that and more. People that sit in the audience, we want something that is true. It's the current that electrifies humanity. So we want to come in and leave politics behind and leave the dangers behind and leave the sadness behind. We want to come here and really celebrate ourselves. It's the joyful noise that needs no translation. It's a wonderful opportunity for people like me who are trans or people of color or people from foreign countries to just get up and really vibe with an audience. And it's a great way to develop community. It's the pulse of New York City. You have a mix of people and you have a mix of ideas. And all of that energy is on the stage. This is what we should be doing with our diverse ideas and with our 
different backgrounds, putting it to good energy. And I've seen artists on stage transform and give us something with each delivery that tells us a new story. And it makes you pay attention to the details, you know? If I shift one little thing in my life, my life will be different. Our venues aren't merely houses, they're homes. Joe's Pub is that. <laughs> it is all the different people coming together and shifting somehow to be in one room with one objective, which is just to learn more, to be more. I couldn't tell you what the world's going to be like in 20 years, but I can tell you that Joe's Pub is going to be a part of it. I think it's really important because it, it got me, it helped me to remember the theater that Lorraine Wright created, you know, this theater of hope that she wrote for, mm. wrote about and mm -hmm. wrote for, where she had a really clear idea of who her audience was and what she was asking of them. And so this whole act of discovery and understanding and involvement is something that she took very seriously. And she wrote her play, and she wrote the ending to her play to engage us mm -hmm. in our imaginations and what we think is going to happen. Um, not just what we want to happen, but what we think is going to happen. Right, right. And how, we, how do we feel about that? Mm -hmm. And so um, I don't think it's necessary to tell us what's going to happen. But I think it's important that we all discover in ourselves how we feel about that. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I think that's clear in Robert's production. Mm -hmm. I think, I think, I think um, you can engage in that way with his ending. Yeah. Mm. And it doesn't change what Hansberry wrote, you know? Right. It just, it, it just if anything, it in, engages you more into your mm. particular uh, stake in that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that, that's the kind of theater, the kind of experience Lorraine wanted you to have and wants you to have with all her plays. Mm -hmm. I think it also sort of, you know, I think that, you know, it also depends on your engagement with the word and how it has uh, shown up in your world. Mm -hmm. You know, because some people in the audience have never had to engage with that word. That's right. You know, and so then they think it's about them. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. You think right. it's about you saying it directly to me. Right. 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 And then there are other people who are like, uh, yeah, I hear that word all the time. I turn on uh, uh, the radio, I turn on, uh, you know, internet. It's all over Walking every, street. every yeah. song that's on, you know. Mm -hmm. all, uh, and yeah. so this is not, uh, uh, I didn't make up the word, you right. know what I mean? Right. Right. Um, and nor did I make up, you know, uh, the suburbs of Chicago. But I think that people want you to hold um, their comfort in mind, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. even to the detriment of reality. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know yes, what I mean? Right. Mm -hmm. yes. They want Obama to be the savior right. of right. all the people. Right. Mm -hmm. you know, even though we know in four years he had to get out of there right. and run again. Right. You know what I mean? Right. Right. So right. Um, there's, there's a level of like, you know, expecting the director to suspend your delete belief throughout your right. rest of your life right. <laughs> and right. that you walk, you know, and I've been, uh, uh, friends of mine have written me and said, you know, I saw the play and I was walking out and no one said anything and it was so quiet. And I'm like, what else, what is there to say? What is there to say? What, <laughs> yeah. I mean, what I don't like about theater is that sometimes you get up from the theater, okay, okay, now what, we're going to have for dinner. Um, what's going on with, uh, uh, we got to go, what's on your shopping list? You know, right. here it's like, there's something that you have to keep and digesting, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Because yeah. it's not what you thought it was. Right. And yet it's what everyone knows that it was. Mm -hmm. Right, that's right. You know yeah. what I mean? Right, absolutely. They were all, we all know what that was. Yeah. Right. And we all know it's true. Yeah, right. But whether we want to pay our money and have an, an evening of entertainment right. reminding us of right. that right. is what makes us sort of like get silent. And right. at the same time, there's this thing, which I'm asked all the time, you know, why is this play still relevant? You know, why is this, you know, 1959 story still get to me? <laughs> yes. Or why is it still topically true, mm. you know? And I think, um, again, my understanding of that is that uh, what I was saying before about this kind of 
theater of, of, of engagement that Lorraine believed in. Mm -hmm. You know, she really believed that theater was a place of, for deep, provocative conversation. And that the place for that to happen is in the audience. Mm -hmm. And if that isn't disturbed, if that isn't activated, if that isn't stimulated, mm -hmm. then she doesn't want to be in that audience. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And so I think that's just so important now to just think, wow, it's not, and it's so interesting that not only are the things, um, the themes in the play current, mm -hmm and um, relevant. But I think, going back to what I was saying about how we're in this pre-movement moment mm -hmm. again, it's time to, to kind of think about these conditions of our lives, whether it's, you know, um, race or feminism or um, um, identity. Mm -hmm. Think of them in expanded ways mm -hmm. so that... Um, these intersectionalities that Lorraine lived in and spoke in yes. and probes in this play um, are more problematic or are or, 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 or bigger, you know, or, or more, or the, the edges are more, you know, kind of raw and incisive, you know, yeah. so that we really go further into yeah. it. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think it's time to to really get into that. And I'm excited about that because, you know, that's the big theme of um, LHLT and the work I do in, at, at the Trust. It's really understanding that these intersectionalities were something that Lorraine, she figured into her play, into each character. Yes. So that you you don't see them as these kind of simple characters, yeah. <laughs> you see them, each, uh, each one of them mm -hmm. as, as um, you know, being on the threshold of new parts of their own identities, yes. you know, yes. um, each one of them. I mean, it's just, and, and I love growing up with the play because I get to see it in like Travis yeah. and I get to yeah. see it in like Carl Lindner. Yeah. You know? It's like yeah. these choices you're making are going to create this problem in your life. Yes. Mm -hmm. You know? Right. Mm -hmm. Yes. And um, nevertheless, I can't imagine you choosing not to go forward with it. Right. You know? So right. yeah. you're growing with each of these characters yes. wondering what's going to happen yes. to them next. And I also think that the, um, the way we, uh, contextualize the play because, of course, you know, I'm sure everyone in this room, if you took African American drama, it was, you know, a part of yes. the syllabus, you right. know. But if you took world drama, it was part of black theater, mm. right? Right. And and I think that at a certain point, it becomes part of feminist theater, mm -hmm. right? And then, right. It, right. It, and now I think it can become part of queer theater, you right. know what I mean? Exactly. So that it's, it's not limited to whether I have to go to a certain class about black people, that you're you know, that, you're, that this is where this play <laughs> lives, you know what right. I mean? Yeah. And that's yeah, about, oh, to, to actually say that she was a queer woman yeah. expands what I think of this play. And so yeah, many people exactly. have written me and said, you know, uh, I just th look at the play differently, yeah. which is what's exciting to me. And, yeah. and what you should do with a classic, you should look at it differently. Right. And I, I just feel that, you know, so, yeah. so many times we allow others to tell us the context of the work, especially yes. in, in institutions, right. you yes, know, like, right. like it's a black play and it's, that's all it and is that's and that's how it that's lives. It is. It's first and foremost black. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. You have to put yeah. your feminism and your queerness away yeah. because it's a black play. Right. You know, and as a writer, I've always been told, like, is it a black play? Is it a gay play? Is it a family play? It, I'm like, it's all that. Yeah. Why can't it hold all of that? Yeah. And she was writing right. before all those movements. That's right. right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Right. Because, you know, she can't, she couldn't stand up and say the things that you can say now at 16. Right. You know, right. you know right. what I mean? Yeah. That's right. But she put them in this yes. story. But the possibilities story. are all in this story. She wrote, and I keep saying, name a play written before 1959 where three black women sit around and talk. I can't name it. Mm hmm I cannot name, and I'm sure, I'm hoping that there is some, but I do not believe that there is a play. And then name it on Broadway. Right. 
know right. what I mean? Yeah. Where she's dealing with giants. She's dealing with Miller and Albie and Strenberg and Ibsen and O'Neill. And all those people have, you know, these playgrounds of Broadway. And she comes stepping up there at 20-something talking about, uh, what about this project in Chicago? Yeah. <laughs> you know right, what I mean? Right, right, right. Uh, and I just did this little thing here. What about this? The, you know? the, the, yeah, yeah. I, we are we are we are coming close to the end of our mm. our a uh, uh, time, but I think just thinking about growing up up with this up with this play, I even I think I was talking about it earlier today about how I cut off my hair. You know, I my I had straight hair right when I was in in college, and then I was going natural around the same time I directed this play. So beneath a, beneath the at, moment. at that moment, it was <laughs> there. There was so much. You know, having this play as a big part of my life and my very early college career, and also you know, trans. Positioning my hair from you know straight to just my natural texture, and then this after some time was something that I can I can just make that very very deep connection to this uh, text and to that that okay 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 character, and then now having children, I have passed that beneath the moment I used to call I used to talk about assimilation all the time in college and it was a it was it was a thing I was I, I talked about it often and how I was you know gonna sort of shift a lot of things in my life and so but now I have children and I've been through a lot of life and so I think more about Ruth and so having this sort of full circle moment is really bringing me you know as, as we as we talk about growing up with with this with this text and the growing that I think people can do as an as an outsider too with this text and also inside mm -hmm. of it. Um, the thing that I love so much about Lorraine's writing her plays are her her characters. She draws such incredible characters. They're yes, just so absolutely. rich and they're so they're so fully developed. And. Um, I'm still kind of reeling in what you were talking about, about, you know, the the opportunity to see three black women sitting around the table talking. And I immediately kind of completed that idea with three generations, mm -hmm. you know, right. because what was so extraordinary to me was um, the um, different stories between these three mm -hmm. women's lives. Mm -hmm. um, their orientations. And I have been able to grow up with this play and be Benita and be Ruth mm -hmm. and now be Lena. Mm -hmm. And um, to understand the fullness of each life yeah. and each dream, you know, that's kind of steering those lives, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and it's just so interesting to me that each person's becoming, you know, themselves. I love the fact that Robert uses the scene with Mrs. Johnson, which isn't always used right, because it's, not. it's a casting yes. problem. Yes. And it extends the play. Yes. <laughs> Just enough that uh, most people don't use it. Yeah. Still. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Even another though actor to pay. it's an incredible, yeah. exactly. Right. Even though it's an incredible, it's an incredible scene. Incredible it's an incredible scene. scene. And she's an incredible character because of what she says that's kind of community based. Yes. And also what she uh, draws out of Lena, what she tells us about Lena. Right. And who Lena yeah. is, who Mama right. is. Absolutely. Mama gets to show us her stuff. Her, yeah. And it's really interesting because um, you really get a sense of, uh, you get to know a little bit more about who this woman is, mm -hmm. her integrity yeah. and her, um, her fierceness. Mm -hmm. And I just think that's a wonderful thing to think about um, um, each of these characters as having wisdom. Yep of having courage um, and at the same time, uh, you know, of, of having spirit, that each character is so spirited. Right. 
Yeah. But at the same time, they are um, they're sort of captured in the lives they're living, and they're living under the conditions of of all kinds of oppressions mm-hmm. that they're, they're they're trying to. An oppression that's coming from, you know, once you're being oppressed from outside, oppression seeps into your house, and yes. there's an individual inside that's this right. house that's right. that is oppressing them. That's right. You know, because of the oppressions happening, and I just find it so fascinating. I, I talk about this a lot, in that Lorraine, because I'm as a writer, I see that Lorraine has constructed a play in which we have decided that this is about this man, mm. uh, and is about his his struggle. Mm-hmm. And yet, Walter Lee stars not one scene in this play. No, there is not right. one scene that begins with Walter Lee on stage. Right. Every scene in this play begins with the women. Yeah. And Walter Lee comes into a scene that has already been set up for him. Yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? Yes. And he walks into a scene. We get information about everything before he gets there, and he just comes in like a bull in a china shop. Yeah. But they <laughs> set up the shop. They That's set right. up the shop. That's you right. know what I mean? Yeah. They are the people who give us That's the right. context of everything. And the idea that these three women negotiate abortion. Mm-hmm. Mm. And then he has to be told that your wife is thinking about right. getting rid of this right. child. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, we get the idea of that, look, don't come talking about no money this early in the morning. Uh, Ruth gets up and she sets the entire house up. She gets his son up. Mm-hmm. And then he comes in. Mm-hmm. He says, you know what I was thinking about? She's like, I don't want to know what you were thinking about. Mm-hmm. I know what you were thinking about. Right. And we all know what you, you know. Right. So there's this sort of amazing, once you do this sort of dramaturgical work, that you realize it's their play. Mm-hmm. Right. And he's... Mm-hmm living inside of it yeah. which is what drives him mad because yes. he doesn't have control outside and he certainly doesn't have control inside that's right yeah that's right, right. Oh, I feel play. like <laughs> yes <laughs> Bro- Robert I would l- love to hear a little bit about how you came to this play in the in the in the first pl- 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 place and and really fell into wanting to direct it? Uh, you know, of course, you know, you, you read the play in high school, you read the play in college, you, uh, and then the, I happen to have become a playwright and, and a director. And I've always, you know, the play was so profoundly important to me in terms of just solid storytelling mm-hmm. and writing. But um, I uh, built a career in being known as a new play director. Mm-hmm. And no one in their right mind would ask me to do this play. It, they, mm-hmm. Of course they would think I would mess it up, like right. I would do something crazy with it. So no one offered me Raisin in the Sun. Mm. Um, and <laughs> they would offer me, you know, madness before the and they like no one really offers no one offers me August Wilson and no one offers me Shakespeare, really. Mm. Um, because they... The, they want to put you in a box. They say, oh, you mm. do this, and then right. that's what you're going to do for the rest of your, your life. And so, you know, um, I remember the first time I was being asked to direct this play, and there was this, uh, and I think it was in Rochester and the Jeeva, and there was all this interrogation mm. and all this sort of like making sure that I had the, my gloves on mm. and that we didn't want you to do this and do that and whatever. Wow. And I was just like, wow, you really are in protection of this play. Right. And uh, and all three of these institutions were run, that I've done the play were run by white people. Mm-hmm. And, and so they seemed to be even overly protected. Right. Uh, but there was just a lot of protection yeah. of the play from me. Right. Mm-hmm. And I'm right. like, I'm the only black person in this conversation. <laughs> yes. Why are you trying to protect this play right, from me? Right, right. Mm-hmm. But I think it's because they had put it in the slot of it meaning something to a consistency that they did not have. Wow. Actually. Right. Right? Mm-hmm. And that they didn't want to uh, make the those people un- upset. And so uh, I did, and I did exactly the type. I investigated the same way I'm investigating it now. And they realized that black people are not a monolith. Mm-hmm. And that people come with all different experiences, mm-hmm. uh, and that L- L- Lorraine Hansberry and the Raisin in the Sun can withstand almost anything. Mm-hmm. So uh, it became a sort of you know because that was done in Rochester, and then you know M- Mandy called and said, uh, "Could I do it at Williamstown, which is one of the whitest places on earth?" You know, <laughs> so the the uh, the audience was one of the whitest places on earth, and I'm like, you know, once again, there is a a sort of who's the audience that's going to see this? Yeah. You know, uh, and so. It was always my goal to find a way to bring it to New York, mm-hmm. right? And so I continued to uh, uh, work on 
my investigating mm-hmm. this, you know, and, and Joy stepped in at that time and, and it was encouraging. And she could have also stepped in and shut it down. Mm. She could have said, that was cute. That was wonderful. We're going to keep this up here at Williamstown right. uh, and, 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 and to the loo, right. you know. And so there was talk of it coming in, that production coming into town mm-hmm. and through a festival. Uh, and then COVID hit. Oh, great. Uh, right. And then, uh, you know, I, I you said something about how you thought the public was a great place, but I never thought of the public because mm-hmm. the only classics really from the public was Shakespeare, right. you know. Um, and so the and new works. And new, and works, new works, right. right. And so, but I thought, the, of course, the public is the perfect place. Right. So when Oscar called, I was like, oh, this would be a perfect place. Uh, and I think this has been probably the most diversified audience in terms of generationally, but also mm-hmm. racially. Mm-hmm. Um uh, and so the way, right. the reason why I am doing this is because I want the play to actually live further mm. and into new places, you know, and I want other people to turn back to that script and go, I thought this was that old play about the black people trying to, in that plant, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Uh, and that, oh, right. wait, it's that, that's this play? Yeah. You know what I mean? Uh, so that's what's exciting. It is my giving back to Lorraine what she gave to me, mm-hmm. actually. And that is a load star to go, I can actually see myself on stage in a way that allows me to be fully who I am mm-hmm. in all my messiness and all my mm-hmm. glory. Um, so that's what brought me to a Raisin in the Sun. I love that. Yeah, thank you. And, you know, just to speak to the audiences, we one of the first thing things that we did for this podcast was after the first black theater matinee, I believe, we received audience uh, f- f- feedback and we stood out, out outside and mm. we're just sort of doing, you know, just having people from the, the show come talk to us out, outside. And there were so many people who just said, I want to talk about the, 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 the play. Mm. And they were so moved and, and it was as if, they had never heard of this play before, mm. before, 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 and so I think this this conversation about legacy really, I feel like it comes full circle just in that the the audience members I've been able and this team has been able to to speak to have have really entered into this work with new new eyes, right? right. They have entered into, into this as if this was something that was just re- that that was just re- written. And and right, right. and and I and I and I think that, that also sp- speaks to, you know, the the conversation that that that, that we've had 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 here um, this afternoon as well. Yeah, I I just wanted to return uh, to uh, to these terms um Reimagining and reinventing, because um, and I, I, I didn't, I didn't really get to go the full distance with it, which this allows me to do. But put a pin on that for a second. One of the things that I've been doing under my watch as literary trustee mm-hmm. is trying to um, interrupt that curating by that interest you're talking about. Mm. Um, Because what you were talking about had nothing to do with me, Mm. Mm -hmm. curiously Mm. enough. It had nothing to do with with rights or with the estate. Mm -hmm. It was of their own making. Mm -hmm. It's a a private interest. Mm -hmm. Mm. And what I'm very interested in is going into these venues like the public Mm -hmm. And helping them to see Hansberry along with their new writers, because I think we are catching right. up to Hansberry. Yeah. I think it's almost um, best understood in a new play context. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so a lot of theaters, big re- the regional theaters, are um, are having a new look and considering Hansberry. Um, in a new way, whereas in the past they'd say, oh, we can't do that classic. We don't do classics. Mm -hmm. Right. Which the public might have said two years ago. Right, right. Right. But I got into an interesting conversation with Oscar about, no, it's time for you to, you know, grow into A Raisin in the Sun. Yeah. Makes all the sense in the world that we're doing it now because we need it now. Mm -hmm. And so um, that's, I'm very excited about that. But I've had to really push that as part of my mission mm. to kind of trouble that conversation yeah. so that 
it's presented, you know, with four new eyes. Right. Um, the, the, the terms reinvent and reimagining are problematic to me because they can be colonizing terms. Mm. And the idea that they put out there is that there's something incomplete about Hansberry mm. that needs to be, you know, some dude needs to come in and kind of like make it right. Make right, it right, right. Fix it. Help and out. the reality is that Lorraine has written the complete play. Yeah. And so we have to find a way to engage it um, in the right way mm -hmm. that really transforms us mm -hmm. and our community and our society yeah. and, you know, helps us to um, learn what we can, you know, we can learn from it. Yeah. And so, um, you know, I'm really excited about the idea of more productions like this, mm -hmm. more, more... Um, and I'm I'm comfortable with interventions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> More interventions like this that just allow us to to yeah. do better. Yes, yeah. you know, so that we can really um, we can really maybe one day catch up to her. Mm -hmm. Yes, because also to the term reinvention, reimagining, uh, what have you. Um, it makes a black woman invisible. Exactly. It it makes her invisible. Exactly. As if she. Uh, and it also makes me a target. Yes. You know? Yes. Uh, and that somehow I need to reinvent something as yeah. opposed to just yeah. do my job and direct it. Right. right. You know? Right. Uh, and that's what I did. And I think I had a conversation with you on and said, I do not want language like that right. around yeah. this play. Yeah. yeah. Right? Absolutely. Because I'm not, I, I can, why would I? Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. Um, so that was, that's very important, I think. Yeah. You know? yeah. 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 It was, it was, it was a very special fall um also because we had james baldwin in the right. building right and so yes. all of the all of the uh, conversations and for, the rain in and his the, building and the rain <laughs> yes and so all of the conversations yes. from this sort of first from you know this relaunch of, of the podcast as we look at the fall yeah. i've been thinking so much about what it what it has meant to have baldwin and hansbury in the same mm building at the same time and I know yes. there's been you know we, we've had articles about it and I, but it's something that I think we can just continue to think about and just and and honor mm. right honor that yeah. that relationship that the, that the two of them have and their work as well um, thank you so much I'm I'm really thrilled that we were able to have this conversation yes good thank trouble. you so much good yeah. show <laughs> yes. thank you but, yes, and thank, thank you. you too yeah I went to see the first production of Susan Laurie Park's Top Dog on the Dog, right here in New York. And that night I said, one day we're gonna be on stage with the holiday come and this woman is gonna write it. It came at a moment when rebellion across the globe was happening. And the film captured the spirit of that as it tells the story of one man's defiance against corruption and injustice. And so our work on the script has been to actually recognize the triumph and the accomplishment of the movie and transmute it for a modern audience. There's so much darkness. We have to find the life force. The life force that allows us to want to move forward. And the way that we do that right now is to find it with each other. That is our number one job in this room. Okay, anybody coming down to here, you're part of that. In 1972, director Perry Hensel debuted his groundbreaking film, The Harder They Come, as a new and unapologetic look into Jamaican culture. Now, just after the 50th anniversary, this film is being adapted into a musical set to open this February on the Newman stage. Join us next time on Public Square 2.0 as we talk with the creators of this adaptation and exhibit.
examine some of the tensions that can arise when trying to represent an often stereotyped culture on stage. Remember to like, subscribe, and follow wherever you listen to podcasts. And we'll see you next time, Thursdays, here at the Public Square. Public theater is... The public theater is... The public theater is a gift. To me, the public theater is like a neighborhood. You know, you know when you live in a neighborhood or on a block, you can go to each other's house and feel welcome when you walk in. You feel like you're at home. That's what the public theater is for me. Welcome home to Public Square 2.0. We can't wait to have you back. Today's episode of Public Square 2.0 was hosted and produced by Garlia Cornelia Jones, Director of Innovation and New Media at the Public Theater, with support from New Media Associate Emily White. Creative production includes story support by John Sloan III of Ghostlight Creative Productions and audio production by Justin K. Sloan of Ghostlight Creative Productions. Special thanks to Joy Gresham and Robert O'Hara. For full list of credits, please visit our website, publictheater.org, for the show notes.